السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. And I will again tackle the same practical phases of the management of neuroblastoma from the evaluation, the preoperative planning and preoperative management and uh, cover the principles of surgery. We'll start with some questions. We will answer these questions at the end of the, of the uh, but you, uh, please feel free to post your answer on the chat box. Which of the following uh, is correct re uh, statement regarding neuroblastoma surgery? A, vascular reconstruction is often required for neuroblastoma encasing vessels. <clears throat> when neuroblastoma is invading uh, uh, an organ, then and block resection is indicated. C, R0 resection is uh, uh, recommended for uh, L2 neuroblastoma. D, L2 neuroblastoma is resected piecemeal. Second question is, which of the following patients with neuroblastoma will benefit from the section of the primary tumor? A, an infant with MS disease. B, a neonate with 15 mils adrenal mass. C, infant with stage four disease. Um, that is, uh, um, can make non-amplified D, uh, four years old with stage four disease um, and a celiac access primary. So starting with the evaluation, this is the commonest uh, solid tumor, extracranial uh, solid tumor with one in uh, 100 children under uh, the age of 15 in the USA, um, translated to uh, an 800 new cases per year. It's most uh, the most common mal malignancy in infants and more than 40% of, of patients uh, are presenting by the first year. And that's basically the curve of <clears throat> age of uh, presentation summarizing, uh, you know, that this is really um, more commonly seen in the first year or two years of life. And the, the predominant uh, primary site is, is abdominal, as um, we've seen. Uh, this tumor is, is really, <clears throat> um, you know, um, responsible for 15% of cancer-related death. So that's just tells you about um, that a lot of the neuroblastoma are presenting with metastatic disease at the time of presentation. 40% of them are, are localized at, at presentation. In terms of the site for metastasis, the vast majority of metastasis, uh, metastatic disease occurs in the bone marrow. Overall, total is uh, 71%, followed by uh, bone and then lymph node and liver. Uh, this is divided by stage, um, as you can see for stage MS or 4S, there should be no bone uh, involvement. Otherwise, that will up change the state to a metastatic, which is stage four or stage M in the new classification. What is the classical presentation of a child with neuroblastoma? Yesterday, we were talking about Wilms tumor that, the, you know, most of Wilms tumor patient looks well. In the contrary, neuroblastoma patients looks ill. And that could be uh, either secondary from the, you know, uh, metastasis and bone marrow infiltration and associated, um, you know, um, a bone marrow uh, sort of uh, all lines being affected, um, including red blood cell, white blood cell count, and, and platelets, uh, or because of the high uh, level of, of uh, uh, catecholamine and you know, the anxiety that can happen with that. Or is the you know, bony metastasis in terms of raccoon eyes, limb, and bony pain. But there's uh, multiple um, clinical features that are, are commonly found in, in, in neuroblastoma. Abdominal mass, when in case of uh, abdominal primary, that can really reach a significant uh, size. They mentioned bone pain, anemia from the bone marrow involvement, hemorrhage, uh, uh, and chemosis, uh, and raccoon eyes, weight loss fever, up, obscronus, myclonus. Uh, diarrhea happens with the VIP um, secreting neuroblastoma. Those are rare presentations. As you can see in this picture, a raccoon eye. And again, uh, in this picture, skin. Uh, uh, metastasis that uh, happens mo more commonly in the MS uh, stage. The rare presentation of obscurus uh, uh, myoclonus that is characterized by rapid eye mo mo movement and uncontrolled jer jerky movement of the extremity and cerebellar ataxia is less likely to improve with tumor resection. May respond to IVIG, steroids, chemotherapy, or uh, rituximab. A prognostic uh, factor for neuroblastoma include uh, tumor biology, age of the patient, stage, the primary uh, site of the disease, and resectability. We'll talk now about resectability since it's, this really has informed uh, the new uh, staging classification. So you can see on the A, which is the left side of the image, mm -hmm. a neuroblastoma that is a botting, a blood vessel, but in less than 50% of the circumference, or 
abutting a, a, a vein, but not occluding its lumen. These are not considered as uh, image-defined risk factors. Image-defined risk factor is more like a more than 50% of ca encasement of the vessel or, you know, occlusion of a vein uh, caused by the compression. I'll just show now different image-defined risk factor based on the anatomy starting with the neck. You can see in the image encasement if I may use uh, the pointer, encasement of the uh, vertebral and uh, carotid arteries, uh, anterior jugular vein, or involvement of the vessels of skull. In the cervical thoracic junction, the brachial plexus, trachea, uh, and um, the subclavian vessels again. In the thoracic trachea, or a, a principal bronchus, encasement of the thoracic aorta, or its major branches, in a, a, a type of, of a, uh, neuroblastomic location uh, resigning in the lower mediastinum, infiltrating the uh, costal vertebral junction between uh, uh, T9 and, and T12. That's because it's uh, associated with um, issues with the artery of Adam Quicks and, and blood supply to the spinal cord. Again, similarly in the chest, um, you can see encasement of, of major vasculature uh, or um, extension to um, the neural foramina. In the abdomen, I just want to show those two pictures of one with a large neuroblastoma that you can see it's pushing blood vessels, but it's not really encasing them. So this one uh, is, is basically negative, um, image defined risk factor, and the uh, resectability is expected to be enhanced, while the one on the right side, on your right side, shows encasement of the aorta and major branches in the middle of the tumor. And that's obviously uh, affect the um, resectability and uh, intraoperative challenges. In the abdomen, again, involvement of uh, uh, major uh, blood vessels or the sciatic notch uh, are, are basically um, uh, the challenges that uh, can be classified as L2 or image defined risk factor, uh, particularly porta hepatis and um, pelvic uh, vasculature involvement, iliac vessels are technically challenging to uh, achieve complete resection. So a few images just showing a porta hepatis uh, infiltration with neuroblastoma. In this one, you can see the aorta is encased in the middle, both renal arteries uh, the, uh, are also encased and also the uh, IVC. Uh, in this image, the celiac axis is completely also encased. And in this image, the renal artery is completely encased and stretched significantly. Uh, uh, as you can see, the, um, the uh, right renal uh, artery, how elongated and stretched it appears. There is also, also some additional criteria that can be considered as image-defined risk factor, which is essentially the dumbbell tumor that causes com compression of the spinal cord uh, uh, and also infiltration of the vital organs, uh, uh, pericardium and diaphragm, kidney, liver, the dunum and creatine block. So moving to the next uh, objective, talking about the preoperative planning and perioperative management. The workup of a neuroblastoma would include the routine laboratory uh, investigation, uh, complete blood count, since neuroblastoma can be associated with um, uh, bone marrow infiltration and affection of all the lines of the bone marrow production. So that's important, uh, renal function test, liver function test, and, and tumor markers then that uh, will be part of the uh, oncologic workup to see the uh, level of the catecholamines. The primary uh, should be imaged with uh, uh, cross-section imaging. In terms of uh, uh, metastatic workup, as we have learned uh, early on, the neuroblastoma goes more to bone marrow and bone lymph node rarely it may that's the size of the lung. So the uh, essential part of the workup will be evaluation of the bone marrow with bone marrow biopsy and aspirate, evaluation of met bony metastasis and bone marrow, uh, uh, bony metastasis with either MIBG or uh, bone scan. And then um, determining then uh, after that uh, workup, which would include also imaging of the chest, whether that's done with CT or, or X-ray, it's the, the, the percentage of involvement of the lung is only like 3% uh, incident. And then uh, that would proceed to whether biopsy of the primary tumor is required or not. So this is an, a, a picture of the bone marrow uh, assessment, which shows the 
you know, brown blue cells with uh, neutrophils, uh, signifying the this is a neuroblastoma infiltrating the bone marrow, and uh, from that um, specimen also a bio tumor biology can be determined and and make amplification status can also be uh, assessed, and then so then if uh, to establish the, the, the histologic diagnosis of, of a neuroblastoma, we either require a pathologic diagnosis is more made from the tumor tissue by light microscopy, or if we get a bone marrow uh, uh, that shows, um, you know, the uh, the image that I showed confirming uh, the neuroblastoma uh, cells with um, uh, an increase in urine or serum catecholamine, that would be enough. Uh, for the for the diagnosis, and um, uh, biopsy from the primary site may not be required in that scenario. And that's a, a logarithm of what we talked about uh, of the workup from uh, history and physical examination, basic lab to the um, urinary catecholamine serum ferritin and LDH, going to uh, imaging of the primary and imaging for metastatic uh, disease. And if if it is metastatic, then bone marrow aspirate uh, uh, may give us the histologic diagnosis. <clears throat> if it is localized, then a biopsy of the primary site, uh, plus or minus uh, bone marrow aspirate uh, would be required. So uh, cross-sectional image of the uh, primary showing the aorta being completely encased. As you can see also calcifications uh, uh, are, are seen and encasement of major branches of the um, aorta is demonstrated. MIBG scan, this tumor is MIBG positive, uh, and, and that's the vast majority of neuroblastoma are actually MIBG uh, avid. And it shows the primary being avid with MIBG and also as a, a, a bony metastasis that has been detected with MIBG. Uh, when uh, um, MIBG, this is obviously MIBG is multiple uh, metastatic sites. If MIBG is not uh, uh, um, available, then bone scan will be a good tool to uh, screen for bony metastasis. I will talk in the rest of my talk about the international neuroblastoma risk uh, grouping because uh, the INSS is an old classification. Uh, the INRG is, a, is the new classification that is be more utilized with uh, many advantages. Um, and it has clinical factors including age, image defined risk factors, and metastasis and biologic uh, risk factor, uh, most importantly, the uh, and make amplifications, the ploidy uh, status, and the 11Q uh, the lesion. So, this slide really explains the rationale for the management of neuroblastoma. As you can see, up in the curve, patients with low risk are doing fantastic, they're always doing great. Patient with intermediate risk still are doing great uh, with surgery and chemotherapy. However, high risk patient, despite the escalation of multimodality aggressive therapy, their outcome still up to date remains uh, not uh, very good. And that's rationalized why we're trying to limit treatment toxicity for those two groups, while for the high risk group, we're trying to increase use any armamentarium that we have, any tools to throw into the high risk in, in, in the hope of improving their outcome. So this busy uh, um, table is a table from the NRG uh, uh, risk classification. And as you can see in the, in the columns, you can uh, uh, see the, uh, this, the, the, the factors that are, are calculated into the risk stratification starting from the NIRG stage, whether the tumor is L1, means it's not encasing blood vessels, doesn't have image defined risk factor, or L2, that is encasing blood vessels and have an you know, image risk factor. The M is a metastatic uh, uh, disease, um, and the MS is that special type of metastatic disease that happens only in infants uh, with a particular pattern of metastasis to the, to the uh, uh, liver, skin, and a minimal 
uh, less than 10% involvement of the uh, bone marrow. If the involvement of the bone marrow is more than 10%, then this is not an MS, this goes to uh, an M, metastatic business. And as you can see, the uh, endemic amplification, the most important determinant factor to, to classify patient into high risk versus, uh, you know, uh, intermediate risk. Uh, so, uh, and that's obvious that uh, th this risk group is associated with um, predicted uh, five years event-free survival, which is, you know, really excellent for very low uh, and low uh, and uh, okay for intermediate, but obviously uh, not so great for high risk. Uh, again, the same uh, busy slide that I showed in a table form. Now it's shown in a tree form to simplify how the algorithm of uh, classifying patient uh, into, uh, you know, very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk occurs. I'm going to break this table, uh, this tree, into little branches now. As you can see, if the histology is uh, ganglion neuroma maturing or ganglion neuroblastoma intermix, this is a very favorable biology. So you don't need to know much about, um, you know, the L status or the age or whatever. This, tu this tumor goes straight to very low risk um, category. Then you, uh, the first line of knowing what is what is the, um, you know, to decide that the risk group is to decide does the patient has an L1, that's not encasing uh, blood vessels, L2, encasing blood vessels, metastatic disease or MS, that special pattern of metastasis is in infant that we talked about. So it is an L1. What is imp most important is endemic amplification. If it is amplified, boom, the patient goes straight to high risk. If it is not amplified, go to very low risk. And we're going to find that same pattern again here in L2, based on endemic amplification, takes it straight to high risk. If it is uh, negative, then age plays a role. Obviously, the young, the young age, less than 18 months, is a favorable sign. And that, you know, based on the 11Q approbation status, it can either go to uh, low risk or intermediate risk. All the patients uh, will uh, go based on their histology, if they were uh, differentiated or not uh, uh, undifferentiated to either intermediate uh, risk, or uh, if they are differentiated, then the 11Q uh, patient will divide them either to low risk or intermediate risk. The special case here in uh, metastatic disease, the first thing you want to know about is their age. If they are older than 18 months, then this, regardless of their endemic status, they will go straight to high risk. If they are young, then if they have endemic amplification, again, they go to high risk. Uh, if they are not amplified, then it depends on uh, their uh, diploidy status. If they are hyperdiploid, which is a favorable, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing, they will go to uh, uh, low risk. Otherwise, they will go to uh, intermediate risk. So, since we were talking about the M and MS, this case for discussion: a three months old female has an abdominal pelvic CT uh, scan revealing uh, a large left retroperitoneal mass, liver metastasis, a skin nodule. How would you proceed? This is basically the infant, and this is the image. Uh, Characteristic. What do you suspect? Obviously, I suspect MS um, in this uh, age category with this pattern of uh, of um, involvement of the liver. Uh, obviously, the information that I need to know is how much the bone marrow is involved, and if the bone marrow involvement is less than ten percent, and there is no metastasis to the bone, then yes, this is an MS. Uh, otherwise, it will be a, 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 a metastatic um, M. And the treatment for that is supportive, and the outcome is very favorable. However, what if the patient was distended in a uh, firm abdomen with respiratory compromise, showing signs of abdominal compartment syndrome? What would you do? This is really how MS patient can get into trouble from the expanding, uh, you know, enlarging liver. So in this really challenging scenario, the plus, you know, obviously the supportive uh, care and chemotherapy and all that uh, is in place, but um, the life-saving um, um, strategies to decrease the intraabdominal pressure. This can be achieved either with an uh, open abdomen scenario, where you put some sort of a silo bag, uh, uh, or, you know, a radiation therapy that can be applied um, to shrink the liver. Um, so then uh, going uh, uh, for in further details to talk about the um, chemotherapy, role and radiation therapy based on the risk stratification. I, I put the same graph I put early on uh, to show the why 
uh, we are de-escalating therapy for low and intermediate risk and why we continue to, to escalate therapy for high risk. Uh, and obviously, low risk can, can require only surgery. Intermediate risk would require surgery, chemothera uh, uh, chemotherapy other based on some factor that we will talk about uh, the four, four, four drugs uh, for eight cycles. High risk will require obviously everything, all um, um, modalities. So chemotherapy can, can be utilized also in the new adjuvant and adjuvant and new adjuvant form. The uh, purpose of that is also to try and decrease the image defined risk factor, decrease the, the size of the tumor, how much is encasing, blood vessels to facilitate resection as, as well. And it's obviously used as part of the multimodal therapy for high risk. And this is the effect of um, chemotherapy on the image defined risk factors. You can see the blue line uh, signifies prior to chemotherapy uh, at baseline and the uh, 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 orange lines after the chemotherapy was applied that image defined risk factor uh, improved strategy. However, uh, you know, that effect of shrinkage on the tumor decreasing its size, sort of plateaus after the third cycle of chemotherapy and further cycles of chemotherapy um, is not really expected to change the size of the tumor significantly or change the, the pattern of image-defined risk factors. Therefore, normally surgery is, is planned uh, in the course of, of, of the chemotherapy somewhere after the third cycle to, uh, you know, do the surgery at the time where you've achieved the, the the maximum effect of, of uh, shrinking uh, the tumor and the image defined risk factors. So for intermediate uh, risk, it was favorable uh, uh, biology, you know, um, uh, a shorter course uh, can be applied for uh, an unfavorable uh, biology, a longer course of uh, multi-drug uh, chemotherapy uh, because this is the uh, COG uh, uh, trial A3961. Uh, some up update uh, on, on this category of uh, intermediate risk uh, on the uh, NL, NPL1232, uh, uh, where basically for intermediate risk patients with uh, image defined risk factor who previously were treated with, uh, you know, um, um, either surgery or surgery plus chemotherapy, uh, observation for asymptomatic patients who are less than 18 months can be utilized for favorable histology and genome. So that means if we have a, 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 an, an infant less than 18 months with a, a, a neuroblastoma that is encasing blood vessel, a biopsy will be required. Whether the histology is favorable and the genomic uh, st studies are also uh, favorable, and, and if that's the case, then this, this patient can be treated on the trial um, with observation. Uh, again, MS, uh, with favorable histology and genomic, who are between three and, and, and 18 months of age, who are asymptomatic, can also be treated with uh, observation. And this is based on uh, the observation that patients below three months uh, are high risk of being symptomatic and developing some life-threatening uh, symptoms and, and worse outcome. Uh, uh, for the uh, MS patients with unfavorable uh, uh, or unknown histology and genomic, who are uh, uh, less than 18 months, obviously, because that's this part of the definition of being an MS, then a res <clears throat> response-based chemotherapy as care protocol will be applied for those. <clears throat> so what is the evidence that drive um, our strategy for low and intermediate risk? It is the observation that they do really well. You know, they rarely progress to stage four and their outcome uh, uh, has been repeatedly to, uh, to be uh, reported as favorable. Therefore, the, the, the rationale for approaching these these stages, uh, these risks uh, group is to, um, you know, limit toxicity. On the other hand, if you see through the decades, high-risk neuroblastoma survival, we have not really made large breakthrough yet. Very minimal improvement uh, in outcome, but no significant um, uh, change in their uh, survival course. Some modalities that has been applied to try and improve the survival rate of uh, uh, high-risk neuroblastoma proved uh, to be helpful and uh, beneficial in terms of uh, um, even uh, free survival. Uh, example is in this graph, as you can see, the effect uh, of um, uh, cis, cis retinoic acid uh, and transplantation, bone marrow transplantation. And, and I'm just showing the diagram of the uh, COG3891, uh, which shows where you know, multi-modality approach, obviously multiple cycle of chemotherapy 
where local control occurs here after the uh, uh, fourth cycle, where we have achieved uh, the maximum uh, you know, shrinkage of the, the tumor. And then bone marrow uh, harvest occurs somewhere around that. And obviously, the patient goes into myeloablative therapy and uh, allogenic bone marrow uh, transplant uh, with all the other uh, added modalities. Similarly, for the COG uh, A3973, um, uh, the multi drug multi modality chemotherapy uh, is, is there. And then, as I've shown in the previous graph, all the uh, modalities that are already in use including the bone marrow transplant, the caronic acid, uh, the anti-GD3, uh, the monoclonal antibodies. Anti, anti, uh, but there is also some new emerging uh, utilized modality, the MIBG labeled with uh, 131I as a radiopharmaceutical agent to target uh, the neuroplastoma. And for patients who have the AL uh, uh, abra uh, abrasion, then uh, uh, presunitinib can be utilized uh, as a targeted therapy for those patients. And this is uh, a graph showing what I just talked about, it, the update of new COG uh, trial, the utility of uh, MIBG uh, 131i as a targeted therapy for AL abrasion uh, patients. Uh, radiotherapy will, will, it has multiple roles. Obviously, it's part of multimodality therapy in the management of uh, high-risk neuroblastoma is also uh, utilized to target metastatic uh, site. Um, and um, in uh, infants that are less than 60 days uh, with MS, as we, we talked about er early on, that uh, infants with MS less than three months can have really sometimes very um, um, severe illness marked with respiratory compromise and, and, and enlarging liver from the liver metastasis. In this patient, uh, we mentioned earlier on, we, they can be treated with an open abdomen to decompress that, 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 um, the com abdominal compartment, or they can receive radiation therapy uh, as well to shrink the tumor and mitigate um, and that problem. Uh, in patients with uh, symptomatic spinal cord compression that has not responded to initial chemotherapy and or surgical decompression, then radiation therapy may also play a role in that. We'll shift now gears and talk more about the principles of surgery. <clears throat> and uh, I'm showing in this image a patient with uh, a low-risk uh, neuroblastoma. However, it's L2 and encasing uh, major blood vessels. And uh, as we have seen early on, that the, um, for obviously, we have demonstrated already the safety of observation only for infants, small L1 uh, tumor. Now the uh, trial has expanded to utilize that for a uh, patient who is L2, who has favorable uh, genomic that can be observed. However, if the tumor shows significant growth during the observation, then uh, uh, you know, uh, a change of strategy may, may, will be required, either uh, surgery or, or, or chemotherapy based on the tumor biology. And I'm just showing the evidence you know, from the, uh, the infant trial that showed the overall survival was excellent uh, for those uh, patients treated with, um, with observation that basically uh, um, the, the background evidence uh, supporting the, the, the practice. These are uh, from the same uh, trial that, this, that I just showed and the gray, gray line are for uh, observation of an un unresected patient. As you can see, uh, they have really a uh, good outcome. This paper also uh, examined the effect of complete surgical resection for um, a, a NRG high-risk patient with localized neuroblastoma. Uh, older than 18 months and, and, and demonstrated um, a favorable um, effect of, uh, of surgery. And um, the uh, update in the um, in this intermediate uh, uh, risk that, uh, in, sorry, in the uh, low risk uh, neuroblastoma, uh, that um, L1 less than 12 months who have tumor less than five uh, centimeter in di diameter can be observed without a biopsy. Since they have no image defined risk factor, they are small and less than five uh, uh, centimeter and, they are, uh, and the patient is less than 12. That, the evidence for that, for that is coming from this trial, from the infant trial. So it's safe to just observe them without a biopsy. However, if they had uh, encasement of blood vessel, then a biopsy is required to know uh, if they have a favorable histology and genomic. And if they do have favorable histology and genomic and they are younger than 18 months and they are asymptomatic, then they can be also uh, observed on the study as part of the uh, ANBL1232 trial. For the MS, which we have covered that uh, uh, 
uh, before that um, any histology and genomic for less than three months of patients which are you know high risk uh, in uh, existing or evolving hepatomegaly or symptomatic then therapy obviously would uh, would be uh, started in a uh, response-based uh, chemotherapy. They have favorable histology and genomic, and they are still less than three months, which is a high-risk uh, issue, but they are asymptomatic. Without uh, 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 existence of evolving hepatomegaly, then they can be observed, and they will have a favorable uh, um, outcome. Uh, if the patient with MS has a favorable histology and genomic, but is older than three months, and obviously younger than 18 months, and asymptomatic, then they should be uh, observed. If they are symptomatic, then um, response-based chemotherapy can be, uh, should be started. So what can you see on this image? Obviously, you can see extension of the tumor in the, uh, and also on this uh, image, you can see the dumbbell, you see the, uh, the large primary and ex the extension inside the canal is called compression. So what would be the surgical principle, surgical strategy in these scenarios? Well, the answer is it depends. If the patient is uh, asymptomatic, then the therapy should be based on the stage of the tumor. If the symptoms were prolonged and chronic, then chemotherapy will be the, the, the um, modality of choice. However, if the symptoms are of acute onset, with acute, acute onset paralysis, then urgent surgery will be required to decompress the uh, spinal canal and the spinal cord. So how about uh, this, those paraspinal tumor that are residing low and transversing uh, sort of those uh, segments from T9 to T12? What is the special uh, principle that should be applied in this challenging uh, anatomical location? Well, that uh, obviously depends, uh, you know, uh, the, the approach is based on the anatomy and the blood supply for the spinal cord, where a significant portion of the blood supply is uh, um, contributed by the, uh, uh, the artery of adequates. So in this uh, patient, uh, it will be uh, advisable to uh, have a good delineation of the anatomy preoperatively for, for uh, adequate preoperative planning in uh, um, uh, obtaining uh, and some sort of an angiogram to demonstrate uh, the anatomy of the uh, artery of abdicate. And um, basically, uh, the surgery, con the conduct of surgery would require care when dividing the intercostal uh, um, arteries that are obviously encased by the tumor and uh, trying to preserve as much as uh, of these intercostal uh, artery, especially the artery that is uh, supplying the artery of uh, Adam Quicks. And also um, to, uh, you know, have that uh, notion of sometimes less is, is more, you know, uh, uh, aiming for a complete uh, resection, jeopardize sometimes the um, blood supply to the uh, vertebral column. And so uh, an intraoperative, you know, uh, neural monitoring uh, has been advised by some other authors. So another case to be discussed, a uh, two years old male is undergoing resection of stage three, which is, you know, um, now in the contemporary classification, stage three uh, name should be uh, an L2, you know, that, uh, and, uh, a tumor that is encasing blood vessel. And after re receiving uh, neodymium chemotherapy, the tumor abuts the aorta, encases the superior mesenteric artery and celiac artery. The tumor also encircles the left renal artery and vein. Let's discuss the key operative maneuver for a safe dissection. How would a safe dissection be a tumor that encasing such um, vital uh, um, blood vessels? Like what you can see here in, the, in this image, that the aorta is really in the middle of all that and all the major branches uh, are completely encased. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we should answer the question of what is the um, benefit? What is the uh, benefit of, of extent of resection um, in, 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 in this sort, sort of high-risk uh, neuroblastoma patient? This has been examined by multiple studies with uh, mixed results. And I'm going to focus more on large studies coming from COG and the SIO. So in the uh, earlier COG, 3891, you know, uh, the um, beneficial effect of complete resection on, on, the, uh, on, on patient with high risk was not clear except in patient with uh, stage four tumor, where it, it was a statistically significant uh, improvement. In other group, there was a trend for better outcome, but not uh, didn't reach statistical significance. Again, in the, the more uh, recent COGA3973, the uh, 
benefit event-free survival that reached statistical significance for a section of more than 90% was demonstrated. Also, it was demonstrated in the uh, local progression uh, by the section extent. Uh, however, the, although there was a trend for improved uh, survival uh, in, um, in, in, in uh, patients who received more than 90% resection, this did not reach a statistical significance. The patient included in this trial were 200 and 20 patients. And, and just recently published the uh, Siopen trial for high-risk neuroblastoma with a really large number of patients, more than 1,500 patients. In this trial, the benefit of complete resection was demonstrated both on, on event-free survival and uh, in overall survival. So essentially then uh, it is desirable to achieve um, complete resection, obviously, with positive microscopic margin, but to, to only remove all the macroscopic disease when safely feasible. So this, the, the conduct of surgery in this scenario is a really vascular type uh, operation uh, where the dissection start by delineating the vascular tip, by bisecting the tumor distally, where we can see the blood vessel uh, more clearly, and then traveling uh, the short distance proximally uh, at the subadventitial plane close to the to the uh, to the 12 o'clock uh, of the blood vessels until uh, you know, the aorta if we started the distal aorta or maybe the common alec if the dissection started with the uh, uh, common alec and going all the way up until all the branches are are demo, are, are clearly uh, 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 you know shown and then after that the tumor can be removed in a piece uh, meal Fashion. The uh, key key uh, element that uh, one should avoid torquing on the blood vessel, especially the renal uh, artery, where this can lead to spasm or can lead to, uh, you know, dissection of the blood vessel, which is even worse than thrombosis. This image shows that a patient who had two neuroblastoma encasing all blood vessels, and you can see now the celiac axis is platinized. Obviously, this is the aorta. And the uh, SMA is also sclatonized here. This is the renal vein crossing the left kidney. That's the left renal vein. The aorta is going down again here. And you can see the, the IMA, the inferior mesenteric artery, is shown here. And the aortic bifurcation is all. Uh, this is a lower uh, tumor. Where you can see the aorta with the uh, bifurcation here to, uh, um, sorry, this is actually the common iliac here. And this is now bifurcation of the common iliac uh, to uh, internal and external iliac and the ureter uh, sling with the yellow sling. Uh, and uh, that was following the subadventitial uh, dissection to delineate the vascular anatomy prior to removal of the tumor. So then uh, how about using minimally invasive approach for a neuroblastoma? And in the context of uh, image divine risk factor, what is the role of, uh, of a minimally invasive approach? Let's see what the literature would suggest. This paper here, um, uh, minimally invasive for neuroplast uh, neuroplastic tumor in children, uh, showed uh, basically uh, that conversion was extremely high in patients with image defined risk factor. This minimal invasive approach was safe in uh, neuroblastoma, small neuroblastoma, four to six centimeters in diameter that are not encasing blood vessels. But if they are encasing blood vessels, then conversion was happening. Again, the same results are duplicated and shown in this paper. However, you uh, we've seen also uh, some uh, other uh, uh, important finding that not only patients with image defined risk factor are high risk of conversion, some patients who are not classified as having image defined risk factor, but they are having, uh, 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 you know, an sort of a subtotal in encasement of, of blood vessel like the IVC without including the blood, the lumen uh, to qualify for being an image defined risk factor, you know, the vein has lumen has to be like included. Even if the lumen is not included, this is really high risk maneuver to be done with minimally invasive and conversion rate or complication will be higher in that scenario. Obviously that depends on also the, uh, the uh, you know, center expertise in, in, in dealing with image defined risk factor uh, with a minimally invasive tool. And, and these are the images, images from this paper. As you can see, uh, the IVC is there, it's not really uh, occluded, the lumen is big, but the tumor is really in close proximity. So uh, minimally invasive approach was not feasible in, in this scenario or in this patient which has infiltration of the kidney or this patient which has an intimate relationship to the renal 
uh, artery. However, it was not in case more than 50%. So maybe the definition of image divine risk factor should be different when image, when minimal invasive approach is utilized and a more light criteria may, uh, may be uh, uh, needed to be applied. The APSA conducted a systematic review to answer this same question of what is the role of uh, MIS in um, neuroblastoma generally and found it is safe in small tumor without image defining factor that are not encasing blood vessels. And it's a, um, you know, um, it can be uh, applied um, on careful patient selection safely. However, they didn't recommend using it uh, uh, for a patient with image defining risk factor, whether that, that was a thoracic section, thoracic neuroblastoma, thoracoscopic, or, uh, or abdominal one, since the evidence didn't really exist to support that. So then how about epical neuroblastoma that are encasing blood vessels? This is a, this poses really uh, an extra challenge because the access, the traditional access to this tumor through the open approach is through the lateral thoracotomy, you know? So you come through the vertebral, the intercostal space to try and tackle a tumor up in the apex. The approach is really uh, an indirect approach. And, and it's uh, really, as you can see from the hand of the surgeon, that a right angle is really directed towards the apex. So it really provides a suboptimal sub uh, exposure. It requires significant uh, reprotraction still uh, without a, 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 an optimal direct exposure to the subclavian vessels. Obviously, the alternative to provide a, a more uh, IV exposure is to uh, subject the patient to a trapdoor incision with sternotomy and all that, uh, you know, complication that happens with such a large uh, incision, which is sometimes uh, necessary based on the complexity uh, of the tumor anatomy uh, encasing uh, vessels and vital structure and should be obviously used uh, when needed. But uh, for a smaller uh, tumor, we were uh, not very satisfied with the exposure that is provided by the lateral thoracotomy and thought of utilizing thoracoscopic um, approach to uh, this particular uh, location of neuroblastoma that is encasing uh, major blood vessels. And this is a picture from, the, from that paper showing uh, one of the patients that um, uh, had the encasement of the uh, subclavian artery and the vertebral artery. And the dissection proceed from the most distal part where the artery is free of the tumor and goes on the, again, same principle of open surgery, going at the 12 o'clock to identify, identify the branches of the uh, vessels and then freeing the tumor branch and the vertebral uh, artery branch, obviously freeing the subclavian vessel uh, as well. I will try and play the video uh, if it is uh, feasible. This video will show left thoracoscopic resection of an epical neuroblastoma encasing subclavian and vertebral artery in a six month old girl with low risk neuroblastoma. However, resection was indicated as the tumor increased in size by 70% during observation. The lateral corner of the tumor was incised with an ART device to expose the anterior wall of the distal subclavian artery and to establish the section plane for the remainder of the procedure. When the distal subclavian artery could be visualized, the lambda section was performed using the ligature device middle and jaw on top and parallel to the anterior wall of the artery from distal to proximal. This technique allows for deliberate exposure of the subclavian artery and branches. The first branch to be encountered was the tumoral branch. Small branches can be controlled with ligature. Larger branches are dissected but not divided until the anatomy of the complete course of the subclavian and its branches are clearly visualized. As dissection proceeded proximally, the origin of the vertebral artery could be seen superiorly and freed with plumb dissection. Once the subclavian artery and the proximal part of the vertebral artery were displayed, a larger tumoral branch anatomy could be verified and controlled with two clips and divided. The tumor is then freed with plumb dissection using an endoscopic kidner or ligature. The tumor is removed from the chest by using an endoscopic retrieval bag. All right, I'll move uh, <clears throat> to the uh, postoperative management uh, component and discussing complications. Um, so obviously the complications range from 10 to 33%. The most significant severe ones are the intraoperative one pertaining to uh, hemorrhage, vascular injury, uh, or um, you know, loss of kidney uh, or kidney atrophy that can be discovered later on, on, on the follow-up uh, or injury to any other uh, organs, including uh, the bowel, 
and uh, one of the common uh, complications is also uh, lymphatic leak. Death is also reported in um, up to 0.5% of cases. A common complication, uh, like as you can see in this picture, Horner syndrome, this is uh, most of the time is not really a complication because it's seen even before the surgery in the preoperative uh, uh, phase when dealing with a uh, patient with uh, epical uh, thoracic neuroblastoma that are involved in the satellite ganglion anyway. So, you know, the, pa the parents should be just um, informed that this is, you know, not likely to be improved by uh, surgical resection. So it's the, 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 you know, pathogenesis of this is actually the ganglion uh, being the origin of the tumor. Also, uh, other uh, common complications I mentioned are uh, chylothorax after thoracoscopic resection or thoracic resection of uh, thoracic uh, neuroblastoma. And these can respond to conservative me me measurement, including low-fat diet and drainage. However, if there was if there were secondary to a major injury to the thoracic duct and the volume uh, uh, is co continued to be high, then essentially the uh, way to address this is is operative uh, exploration and uh, controlling of the injured thoracic duct. For abdominal uh, chylus ascites, conservative management is pretty successful. This is a really common uh, postoperative uh, complication, but uh, rarely, if ever, requires, um, I would say rarely, it, re it requires uh, drainage or intervention. As this paper has shown that it's, you know, lymphatic leak after uh, neuroblastoma surgery is, you know, significantly common. However, all patients in that study were self-limited, didn't really require uh, intervention. Uh, other complications that are best prevented rather than managed uh, are, um, you know, renal artery spasm. In the case, key uh, um, technical um, step to really prevent uh, renal artery spasm is to prevent torquing on the uh, blood vessels. If, however, uh, a spasm has been observed intraoperatively that most of the time will be noticed by the color of the kidney, then topical paparavine or lidocaine can be applied to, uh, you know, uh, induce uh, 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 vasodilatation, reversing the vascular spasm. Uh, in patients who are high, high risk for, for, you know, based on their perivascular dissection and tumor anatomy, then a low dose dopamine can be started at the time of the surgery. There's no strong evidence to support either of the two maneuvers. My personal preference from a limited experience, if a vascular spasm is, is, uh, is encountered, then uh, topical uh, papar paparavine has helped uh, in, in these very rare scenarios. Uh, vascular uh, injury is also, again, the best strategy is to prevent it. As we know, neuroblastoma encasing blood vessel require really, uh, they are high risk, so they require multimodality therapy. Surgery is not the the, uh, the main player of the big picture. It's, yes, it has a, a positive effect on the outcome, but you know, the most important thing is, is for the patient to recover quickly and go back to receive chemotherapy and the rest of the multimodality therapy uh, and, and avoidance of major complications that will delay initiation of chemotherapy or, or worse, uh, vascular, uh, intraoperative vascular injury uh, uh, based on some paper that I'll show is not really um, uh, easily correctable. Uh, and, and preservation of organ function after reconstruction is not, uh, the success rate of that is not high. So all measures should be done to prevent that by applying the principle of a safe perivascular dissection for neuroblastoma in centers with uh, um, high experience in doing that. So uh, this paper really uh, reported the significant percentage of, uh, of major uh, um, vascular uh, injury in about 10% uh, where uh, reconstruction uh, didn't really achieve um, um, major success. Most of those uh, were reconstruction of renal artery, but um, the kidneys uh, were not, um, the salvage of the kidney uh, in that paper was not really high. An injury to other uh, uh, part of the, um, of the vascular tree, major part of the vascular tree, including the aorta, uh, or uh, up in the uh, carotid um, and vertebral artery in this paper was actually associated with death. So that really highlight those, those injuries should be prevented uh, rather than uh, uh, treated. And vascular reconstruction should be uh, rarely, if ever, required in, in, in neuroblastoma uh, 
surgery. So the message to take home really is um, accurate staging is in, imperative because as we've seen, based on the risk stratification of, of patients, some patients won't require a biopsy and won't require resection who can be safely uh, observed. Those are the infants with small uh, tumor that are L1 or the uh, MS uh, category uh, that are asymptomatic. Uh, patient with non-high risk uh, tumor need as little treatment as appropriate and will have great outcome. The majority of patients with high risk tumor will eventually relapse uh, and intense treatment is aimed at giving them best overall chance. Our zero resection, a uh, resection with negative margin, is not really required, uh, especially when we're talking in the context of uh, L2 neuroblastoma, where well, that would require injuring the blood vessels and, and should aim for our, our one uh, with organ preservation. You know, leaving microscopic disease is absolutely uh, acceptable and part of the principle of surgery for uh, neuroblastoma with encasing blood vessels. And the surgery, uh, principle of surgery really depends on appropriate preoperative and intraoperative delineation and identification of the tumor anatomy. The removal of the tumor comes as a secondary maneuver after vascular anatomy has uh, been uh, clearly delineated and protected. So just a final uh, slide to summarize uh, trials and, uh, and, uh, uh, and different stages and approaches for a patient with L1, not encasing blood vessels, that are less than five centimeters, who are less than one year, can be observed on the uh, ANPL1232. When the tumor is larger than five centimeters, then the uh, primary section is indicated off protocol for patient with uh, image defined risk factor encasing blood vessels, but they are uh, anemic and amplified, and they are also young less than 18 months and have favorable biology so as uh, two you know uh, favorable features then initial observation is appropriate on the trial with treatment further treatment if the tumor demonstrated more than 25 percent increase in the volume for patient with um, L2 make amplified or young but have unfavorable biology or the patient with um, L2 and make an amplified who are older than 18 months but have favorable biology, or the one who is and make am not amplified who has both risk factors that are older than 18 months and have unfavorable biology. The treatment of those patients would require, you know, uh, multimodality therapy in terms of chemotherapy and resection. Uh, for the first example, uh, you know, partial resection uh, is is acceptable in on ANBL1232 uh, and um, uh, on. Uh, um, the, the last category I mentioned, which has all unfavorable, you know, uh, older than 18 months and unfavorable histology and high risk therapy, scientific therapy plus resection uh, would be indicated. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. I am going to have a look at the chat. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Hafiz, for your amazing, super presentation, mashallah. Uh, we have a multi of question. Uh, the first one from Sayyid Al Hadi is asking which type of biopsy considered for a local uh, localized neuroblastoma? I think uh, it doesn't uh, um, matter what type of biopsy is done for neuroblastoma. Since you know tumor spillage is not a big risk, is not a big issue for tumor. obviously it should be uh, avoided, but it's not a big uh, issue for neuroblastoma. But the most important question is: Does the patient need biopsy or not? If the patient is younger than a year has an L1 that is less than 5%, that patient does not require biopsy, no resection. Just observation is all what that patient requires. For patients um, who are have metastatic disease and had a bone marrow showed. Neuroblastoma had high catecholamine, and we were able to state them and get whatever you know a biologic marker that we require from the bone marrow biopsy respirator. Why shall I go then after the primary tumor? Especially if the primary tumor location is difficult with some blood vessels nearby, so the diagnosis can be settled only on bone on bone marrow. In scenarios other than this, where you actually really need biopsy from the primary tumor, then an image image uh, guided core by adequate cores to provide adequate tissue for all the biologic uh, you know and analysis that is required would be the, um, you know, the, the modality of choice with the, you know, um, utilization of uh, interventional uh, radiology services that can approach the tumor, you know, maybe from the back, away from the vessels, uh, pretty safe. But if that's not feasible, then, you know, laparoscopic or open biopsy are all uh, are all uh, acceptable. But obviously, the, the, the biopsy modality of choice when required will be image guided. Core biopsy. Uh, the second question from anomalous attendees, uh, are there uh, age limit limits for uh, commencement of chemotherapy and radiotherapy? Uh, the the um, 
timing of the local control, uh, you know, radiotherapy and, 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 and surgery is most of the time uh, timed uh, in a sort of close uh, time zone. The surgery happens, as I mentioned, somewhere after the third cycle. And it was variable approaches of where people do it sometimes after the fourth cycle or the fifth cycle. And then um, after, uh, because, you know, as we show seen on that graph, after three cycles, you get the maximum shrinkage tumor, the maximum benefit on, on image defined risk factor. And then, you know, at that interval, the patient will get, you know, surgery, get the uh, if he's high risk, we'll get the the um, the uh, harvest uh, of the bone marrow. And not every patient require radiotherapy. Only high risk uh, patient uh, would require radiation therapy. You know, but you know, uh, intermediate risk and low risk. You know, even you may have a positive margin, but you won't really require radiation therapy. And obviously, after the patient recovers, then would go back to commence the adjuvant part of chemotherapy. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ala Ali. Do all cases of intraspinal extension need a radiotherapy? Uh, no. Uh, uh, the, essentially, if there is, if the patient is asymptomatic, then the therapy is directed based on the stage of the patient. Mm, sure. you know? If the patient is symptomatic, then you have to know, is, is the symptoms acute one step? Then surgery will be the modality to decompress uh, the um, canal. And if, but if it is a chronic one set of symptoms, then a chemotherapy will be the modality of choice. And that will avoid the uh, laminectomy and all the morbidity that comes with it. And then just applying the chemotherapy and shrinking the tumor <clears throat> uh, uh, to achieve that. Sure. Uh, also, Ala Ali, he's asking, uh, how can you detect a renal artery spasm? Fantastic question. 100% of the time, most of the time, by seeing the color of the kidney. So although in doing neuroblastoma surgery, you know, which is really intense and com complex and you're using your loops and you're dissecting around the aorta and renal artery and SMA and, and all the major vasculature, one has to keep an eye on the color of the kidney constantly. Every now and then you would see uh, how profuse the kidney is. And the first sign of a renal spasm could be uh, that the, the, the color of the kidney is getting a bit duskier. <clears throat> Obviously, you can also sometimes see the caliber of the renal artery grows a little bit uh, smaller as a result of the, of the spasm. I think the, 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 the change in the color of the kidney is the sign that really get picked, uh, picked up uh, the most. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abdelhafiz. I think there is no more questions. Um, we are very happy, Dr. Abdelhafiz, that you join us in our review course. Uh, you summarized the topic, mashallah, very nicely. Thank you so much, and see you soon, inshallah. Thank you. I have questions for you, though, for the audience. Yes, <laughs> yes sure. I, I have this strategy. If they don't ask me, I ask them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not, I don't have really new questions. This is, I'm just, this is the last slide to uh, show the question that we asked at the beginning of the yes, talk. Sure. And just to conclude, about the answer to those questions, which of the following is a correct statement regarding neuroblastoma surgery? Vascular reconstruction is often required for neuroblastoma encasement. No, we should avoid that, as we've seen. B, when neuroblastoma is invading an organ, then M block resection is indicated. No, we shouldn't do, you know, uh, pancreatic to do M block resection with neuroblastoma. It's all, uh, the surgery should be all vessel preserving, organ preserving. So C, R0 section should be attempted for, um, or I will frame this question differently. R0 resection is indicated uh, for L2 neuroblastoma. Well, L2 neuroblastoma is encasing major blood vessels. R2 requires resection with negative margin. So that really requires resection of the blood vessel to achieve R2. So I don't think R sorry, R0 uh, is indicated uh, for, uh, for L2 neuroblastoma. However, we should endeavor to uh, accomplish complete, complete macroscopic resection. And obviously there will be some microscopic residual disease on the, on the wall of the vessels. And that's totally acceptable and part of the principle of neuroblastoma. So this statement is also not correct. <clears throat> D, uh, L2 neuroblastoma, that's obviously in case in blood vessel surgery, involves piecemeal removal of tumor after delineation of the blood vessels. And that's essentially what we have discussed, that it's a vascular procedure. The first priority is to delineate the vascular tree, then you can remove the tumor uh, in between uh, after all the blood vessels uh, are protected. And thank you very much for uh, listening and thank you for inviting me. It has been a, a great pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Hafiz. Thank you very much.